Welcome to Huntley Hope. We have got a great program for you today. You know, you hear a lot about binge watching. We hope you binge watch this show, but a lot yeah. of people talk about Netflix and HGTV is another uh, station that people just binge watch. Those oh. home reno shows, deck building. Do you ever watch those? I, I watch them on airplanes sometimes, uh, but my wife loves them and she has them usually on her iPad. And I'm going, what are you watching? All oh, those, you know, home renovation shows and I'm not much interested. And then I'll start to kind of watch and I'll be peeking around the corner. Then I'll kind of, and I get totally involved because you see the transformation in many of these houses and the building and you get some good ideas as well. I know I don't get a lot of time to watch it but when I do I can get totally addicted and start watching like every episode one after another. Oh, yeah. It's really bad. Well today we're going to feature deck do it yourself from HGTV. Paul LaFrance will go behind the deck building and then later on he's going to join us in the studio along with his wife Janet to talk about a heart shattering family tragedy. You're not going to want to miss it. So let's head outdoors and do some decking. Man, from what we had before to what we have now, monumental change. HDTV host Paul LaFrance is well known for his incredible design sense, amazing decks, rock star style, and mischievous <laughs> sense of humor. While he's currently hosting three shows on the network, Deck Wars, Disaster Decks, and I Decked Out, down. taping has already begun on a fourth called Custom Design. Add to all of that his own successful design company, plus a busy home life with his wife and four daughters, and Paul could be forgiven for not knowing which day of the I month it currently is. 100 Huntley Street had the privilege of visiting with Paul on one of the beautiful decks he's built to find out some of the things you might not know about this energetic television personality. Let's get going. But first, of course, and true to his nature, there was a little competition to start off the day. I'm thinking he definitely had an unfair advantage here. You want to do a little competition here. I don't know what I think about this. Well, I believe that you have skill maybe that you don't know about. Do you handle pressure well? Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, of course. Yeah. We're why being authentic, have, right? Why do you have such fear in your eyes? <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. Five screws. Yeah. And on your marks, get set, go. There's one. <laughs> There's two. You're doing very well. There's three. You're killing it. Ah. Oh, we have to watch the sharp end. <laughs> I, believe, I believe in you. There's four. <laughs> You're doing very well. I don't think so. And there's five. Okay. <laughs> give, me, give me the bad news. 17.56 seconds. Oh, man. My first time, though. It was your first time. Just, But just imagine the pressure I'm feeling right now. <laughs> All right. And go. Oh, wait. Don't drop. It's <laughs> going way too fast. Oh. Did I keep my reputation? 8.61. Oh, Man. full 10 seconds. Well, nine it's, seconds, really. Nine seconds, yeah. Nine seconds. I, was, I was hoping to not just beat you, I was hoping to decimate you. <laughs> and that just isn't good enough. But I'm not competitive. I'm not competitive. But you have a real, you've been doing this, so what's your best time ever? My best time ever is 6.5 seconds. Okay. So I'm, I'm slow today. You were. I was distracted. But you were being kind to me, actually. You're probably just trying to make me look good. No, no, really. That was terrible for me. <laughs> yeah. So you should feel good. I was flustered. Oh, I was very so flustered. you beat me by almost nine seconds when you were being terrible. Yeah. Yeah, Thankfully, the competitive portion of our day was over, and we could sit down to talk about <laughs> Paul's faith, it, family, and, and what it's really like to work with him. You know, and I'm surrounded by a wonderful team of people that will help me, help me, you know, bring what's in my zany head into reality. Um, but the, the, by being a creative person and, and, and having an unwillingness to compromise creatively, which when you have deadlines and networks and you know you have to deliver and this that and the other, that can be stressful. And so I can be a very big pain in the butt to work with on that capacity because I cannot compromise the creation. So that's tiring, but it's rewarding. One of the things that I noticed talking to you is that fame doesn't have you. You know, this role doesn't own you. Mm -hmm. And people might think that's just how you came out of the womb, you know, just not caring. <laughs> but I know from when you started that story that you left deck building to start your own business mm -hmm. to where you are today, actually has a lot of painful moments and we don't have time to unpack it all, but can you just give me a sense of how God has brought you to this place where you have all this, but yeah. you don't care about it? Yeah. For me to start this business, knowing nothing, go through all the years of struggle, the only thing in all of those times when we were making no money, I mean, we went from at $17,000 in debt, I was so overwhelmed with anxiety um, that I thought I was gonna die you know, in the early years of the company. Um, at $80,000 in debt, 
I had it out with God. I was like, what are you doing? You know, I, we are being faithful. We are tithing. You know, we, we, we don't ever do anything under the table. We are honest. Everything is above board. Why are we struggling so much? And God just said to me very clearly, he said, with where I'm taking you, I need you to trust me no matter what. Will you be willing to do that? And I was like, what are my options? I'm like, well, okay, you know. And I thought at that time, making a decision to trust God at $80,000 in debt was a very mature decision. I thought, this will impress him, you know. And, and I feel <laughs> now he will say, oh, there you go, you passed the test, and now millions of dollars will come into your hands, you know. And the great success in business. But that's not what happened. At $80,000 in debt, when I thought things were going to get better, they went to 100000 to 150 to 200000 to 300,000, till finally at $365,000 in debt, you know, strangely the same amount of, of uh, it's the same number as the days of the year, which I thought was rather unusual. $1,000 for every day of the year. $1,000 for every day of the year. <laughs> at that point, I was completely and totally free from fear and anxiety of money. And I had asked him for that. I had asked him to be free from the things that control people in this world, you know, and and I had the revelation then. At, and then he showed me something and he said, Paul, do you realize that in the culture that you live in, in Western culture, most people wake up every single day under a humongous demonic lie that says, everything you have can be taken away from you just like that, unless you do everything you can to prevent it. Well, that's fear. That means you wake up every day ruled by fear. And I now know what it's like to not live that way. One day God said to me, will you allow me to expose in you everything that is still not truly authentic and not truly real? There was a lot of things in me that I did not give to God. And it was an act of the greatest love that he ever showed me to say, I will show you where you are still holding back from me. I didn't understand that the day that I walked out into the forest and fully aware of my own internal wretchedness, I was going out in the forest on this particular day to disqualify myself. Say, okay, I'm, I am not, I cannot live up to the calling that you've put on me. I cannot live up to it because this is what's in my heart. And so the most unexpected thing on that day was for me to hear what I heard God say. And that is, today is the day I choose you. Today's the day I choose you. And he said to me, Paul, every other time that you have chosen and said yes to me, you have, you have said yes thinking that you have something in you to offer. He goes, but today you are, you are being asked to say yes, fully aware that in and of yourself, you got nothing. That day, everything changed. My whole life changed. My whole perspective changed. That day, I stopped trying to be a Christian. That day, I understood that all he wanted me to do was be exactly who I am, be completely real, completely vulnerable, completely authentic, and in particular with the things that I struggle with. Put it all on the table. And failings, put your failings on the table. Mm. From that day forward, I was amazed that when I was started to be really vulnerable with people and tell them my story and tell them my failings, suddenly people would be like, I've never talked about this my whole life, Paul. Here's my story. And I'm going, what is that? Did you just lay your heart out and trust me with that? And I feel God tapping me on the shoulder going, yeah, they did. Because you put yours out there first. I don't go knocking on people's doors. I don't start conversations about Jesus, ever. 
people ask me. I'm not advertising that I'm a Christian. People just come up and they say, what is different about you? Let me introduce you to my friend, you know. He is wild, he is adventurous. You're on a roller coaster ride. I got on that ride a number of years ago and I am not getting off. All my scars, they still remain. But my heart is bleeding fine. Is this world of celebrityism going to affect me? <laughs> there is nothing you can throw at me in this world that is going to compare to the emotions and the the love and the purpose of his world. This is just Well, thank you. It's been such a pleasure to sit down with you and pack just a small part of your life. Fun. You're welcome. When I fell down today But I got up again God's love is like a fire. When it ignites and when it spreads, it can transform anyone. I called 100 Huntley Street the prayer line and that was a real turning point in my salvation. We serve a God who can take the ashes, the broken pieces of our life, and he can make something beautiful. So I said, hmm. God, if you're this real, I will do anything that you want me to do. God's love story can inspire anyone to make a difference in the lives of people around the world. We are very sure, we are very optimistic about our future because we know we will plant, we will have water to drink. You become influential by setting a new pace. The gospel is timeless. Every single person has a story, but we're all part of God's greater story, which is the greatest story of all. I just love that interview with Paul LaFrance, and I th I'm a fan now. I know, I mean, right? I mean, he's, he's a very extremely talented guy, musically and all that, but really the way he shares his heart, he's not a religious guy, he loves people, and, and you said, like, you've been with him and his wife out for dinner, and people are just attracted to him like a magnet. And you know what it is, and I think he shared the secret right there, is that he went through such extreme, God took him through such extreme circumstances that it killed fear in his heart. And he's just not afraid. He doesn't care what people think about him. He's not afraid of financial disaster. He's just, he's just him. And there's something so free and beautiful about that. I think people see that and they think, I want that. Yeah. I want to be like that. And I think only God can do that work in our heart. And I mean, he had to go through some hard stuff to get it. Well, and you know, you would not, you know, when we, sometimes we pray these things and God, whatever you need to take Take out of me, take out of me. And then he, $365,000 in debt. I, as I'm listening to that, I'm going, you got to be kidding. But it's what broke the fear, financial fear of him and being in debt. Now, certainly that is not, economists would not give you, or, you know, financial <laughs> planners, that's not the way you do it. But in yeah. Paul's case, it broke something. And now look at, you know, it's like he was broken, totally hit the bottom and, and financially, and then the Lord has raised him up and he can handle the success now that he's had. And sometimes God takes us through tough things for that very reason, you know, and, and it's stories like this that I think it's so important that we share. That's why we're so passionate about 100 Huntley Street and Huntley Hope and continuing to be here to bring stories like this across Canada because we, we need to hear it. Like, yeah. you need to hear it. I need to hear it. You need to hear it. Builds our faith. It absolutely does. It challenges us in every way. And we just want to invite you today to partner with us and, and help us go strong, you know, every single week with the show Huntley Hope across Canada. We just uh, value your support, your prayers, especially your encouragement, also your financial support. You know, if this show has ministered to you and you've been encouraged by it, please help us continue that. You can give us a call at 1-800-265-3100. You can go to 100huntley.com. Lots of ways to give. You know, and Cheryl, it has not been easy for the LaFrance family, e even in their marriage and their family. Absolutely. Up next, the heart-shattering tragedy that struck Paul Paul and Diana LaFrance, here's that interview. I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I had my entire life planned out. It certainly involved a lot more money and a lot less pain. Unfortunately, life rarely cooperates with those expectations and how we deal with that 
really has such a dramatic impact on what happens next in our lives. Well, my guests today, Paul and Diana LaFrance, have experienced heart-shattering tragedy, but they say with God's help, the experience has only made them stronger. Thank you so much for coming to share your stories. We love coming to hang out with you. Oh, I love it too. And you know, Paul, <laughs> you're well known to our viewers. You uh, host many HGTV shows, more than we can actually even say, <laughs> more all the time. <laughs> you're taking over the network. Thousands. I know. And Jenna, you're an amazing author. I'm a fan of your books and you guys do so many other things. Do you want to tell me all the other things you do? I can't, I can't, you know, you band, seconds, seven I know, exactly, <laughs> design business, yeah. Yeah, you're, we, you're busy. Yeah, there's, there's busy and then there's stupid busy, and I think a lot of people often are asking us, like, how do you do it? And we're like, we have no idea. I know, I don't know how you do it with, either. With four, with four girls in the house that are all in that hormonal stage right now, mm. there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of holding each other and and just and just whispering in each other's ears. <laughs> and then ear there's going, nothing to say. It's just a silent just, just, yeah, just, <laughs> just We're just letting each other's energy. Well, we're so glad that you cut through the chaos and just made time for us. We always appreciate that. And today yeah. you're here to talk about something not so easy, but with a great ending, I think, in a sense, how God's worked through your life, and that's the loss of your daughter. Uh, do you want to tell me a little bit, Jana? Why don't you start? Well, when we were uh, we first got married. Uh, we kind of thought we wanted to wait for quite a while before we had any kids because we were really involved with ministry and, you know, wanted to travel and, you know, have alone time. And uh, a friend of ours, Curtis Hines, said, uh, you guys just wait. You guys are going to wake up one day and say, realize there's something missing. So sure enough, we uh, ended up getting pregnant. We'd only been married for about two, two and a half years, I think. Yeah, and uh, she was born, but she just never took a breath. Um, so it was a bit of a, it kind of perplexed the, the medical community and the, the doctors and midwives who were involved, um, just because they had her hooked up to heart monitors and stuff during the, the labor and everything was strong and normal. Mm. Um, so for them, it was like, they called it the God factor. Um, God factor. Yeah. yeah it's up and coming obstetricians. Yeah where they, they've actually asked permission to use her, the story in her heart monitor to teach physicians to look at it and say, okay, now can you see anything abnormal with this and analyze it and so that they could say that this, this child didn't survive. And I think those are those unexpected curveballs we talked about at the beginning here is just that you're serving God. You know, he's in your life. You've given everything to him. You're going to have a baby. It's like the best time of your life. And yeah. then he takes her basically. Yeah. Paul, how did you deal with that? Well, let's just say that up until that point in my life, I had a pretty good temper. Like I would get, I could get, I could fly off the handle pretty easily. And uh, she can attest to that because we had some pretty good fights. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> but what was unexplainable after that happened was I was not angry for a single moment. And, and that's, what, that's how I knew there was a lot more going on um, because, you know, talk about an injustice, right? I mean, everything's normal, everything's fine. And then, and she's just like that, she was gone. And it just literally felt like for the next little while we were in this God bubble and there was something very, um, I mean, something you wouldn't wish on anybody, but there was something that now looking back very important about that season um, in understanding what our heart's desire was. And that is like, this is about you and you alone. And the one thing that, that was always the, like the greatest connection between us was just, you know, neither of us had met the other, another person that had the same desire just to be like, we don't want any games. We don't want to play church. We want you and you alone. That's the, that's, that's the goal. It's not about what we're going to do. It's not about, you know, climbing some church ladder. It is you. And so what we learned out of that was completely and utterly uh, unexpected. Um, but at that time, I mean, we both had had these ridiculous uh, visions of the same thing of this little five-year-old girl, you know, coming in. You know, she saw it in the hospital room and this, and had Jan's little ski jump nose, you know, and just, and it was like, I'm okay. I'm okay. And, and I had seen the, the exact same picture a little while later. Mm -hmm. And so um, what God sa had said to both of us 
in the, in, the, in the time ahead is just some phenomenal things that changed our lives. So God's so real to you in this recovery from this horrible loss. And yeah. you know, to, to make this story make sense, you have four daughters now. Yeah. You lost a daughter, you have four daughters. So yeah. that, what God was saying, he is fulfilled and yeah. they're beautiful daughters and, um, and you've named them such beautiful names. You actually commissioned an artist and here's another God moment. Oh, it's geez. just like he's littered your life with these God yeah. moments after yeah. this tragedy. Yeah, how much time do you have? Tell, yeah, <laughs> we're actually running out of time. So tell me the story. Go, 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 go. <laughs> tell me the story of the paintings that you commissioned for your daughters. Okay, I'll tell you the story because I'm faster. <laughs> um, True. We have a good friend named Heather, um, Heather Sinnott, and she's a, a fantastic painter. Um, Paul commissioned her to do a painting, a, actually a few paintings, um, and he designed and, and built a deck at, at her place and her husband's place. But um, we asked her if she would paint each of the girls' names, and she had this idea that Paul and I write a letter to each girl, mm -hmm. and then she copied either the whole letter or a lot of the words from the letter in the background of the painting, and then stuck the actual letter to the back of it, and then just did something abstract around the name. So um, they, they're amazing, these four beautiful we things. We have pictures just, of them, I think, yeah. Okay, and she just followed God's leading on what colors to use and everything like that. Mm -hmm. There's your daughter's but, glory, yeah. and what's the next one, hope. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, promise. Yeah. yeah. Promise and uh, Rhea. Rhea. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, anyways, a while later, I got this message from Heather saying, um, "This crazy thing happened." Uh, she said, "When I was when I was getting ready to paint these pieces, I was getting into worship and just really wanted to hear from God, like how to do them and what colors to use. And I did like a practice piece, like just an initial one to get into the headspace. And I found myself painting the name Grace or the word Grace. And uh, she knew nothing about Chris. So she did this painting, Grace and the colors and everything else. And she kept it because it wasn't relevant to us, right? Yeah, there it is. Right so, there. yeah. So she just put that, you know, on her own wall and gave us the four paintings and that was it. But um, then like a year or two years later, she read a blog essay that I wrote about losing Caris and was like, oh my gosh, because Caris is Greek for grace. And she was like, this was meant to be for them. This she is did the painting at the same time. Daughter. Yeah. And just yeah. felt stupid because she was like, I don't know why I did this. And she yeah. just left it aside. And I think because yeah. for the two of you, you say you have five dollars, like or five daughters, <laughs> five dollars, yeah, five, <laughs> five dollars, <laughs> because she's so real to you. Like her, you, you had visions of her yeah. in heaven. You know that she she's your daughter. Yeah. yeah. Here's <clears throat> I cannot stress enough how particularly in our culture, we, we just want to avoid suffering like the plague, right? This is a temporary time that we are here mm -hmm. and, we, and things are not what they seem. And the closer you get to God, the more you realize that, that things are not what they seem. And, you know, a, a number of years later, I had an experience with God where he literally, it was, it was like, it was as real as you sitting right there. And he was like, if I could give you your daughter back in exchange for what you have learned about me, in that period of time, as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and you're kind of going, I don't want that. That part is, that's uncomfortable. I don't, I don't, sorrow and grief, no thank you, you know. So he said, would you, would you take it? Would you take that, that opportunity? Her back in exchange for what you've learned from me. And I was like, not a chance, not a chance. I absolutely knew without a shadow of a doubt, I know where she is, Jana knows where she is, I know that if that had not taken place, I would have had five daughters, but I would have missed all five of them because I would have been just so busy with life. And now I have four daughters. I know where my fifth one is. And those four girls know every day how precious and valuable they are. And I would not have known that. So things happen for a reason. They do. Well, I, there's so much more we can unpack about your story, but we're out of time, but we'll, we'll have you back. Thank you so much for sharing your hearts. And I know one of the most painful chapters of your life, yeah. but lovely to see how God's in the middle of it all. If it longer, we would have been a weeping mess. So. <laughs> I know, you were making me cry. <laughs> well, if you're watching this, and I know so many of you have gone through hard times, maybe that's made you question if God's real or if he cares about you or you know if he can actually ever be in your life and help you with the hard stuff. Why is let it happen? You know, We want to help you answer some of those questions. We have people on our prayer lines 24 hours a day, seven days a week, talking to you anytime or just listening. If you want to help process some of the hard stuff in your life, give us a call.
We'll be right back. It surrounds you. It wraps you with peace. It carries your heart. When the days are dark, when the questions are hard and the answers are far from reach, I call out to you in your weariness, with your heavy burdens that you don't know how to carry, pain that no one can bear, I will reach out my arms to you, come to me, let me embrace you, let me help your soul find rest, give me your heaviness, hand over your pain and sorrow. We will walk together. You won't have to do it alone. My load is light. I'll carry yours too. Rest in me. I'm here. Comfort. It's my promise to you. And God's promises are real. You know, I, as a dad, and I have three daughters and, and a son, and listening to their story, losing a daughter for no medical reason, uh, I was just, you know, just awestruck by how the Lord has turned that around. And for Paul just to be so honest in saying that for what he learned, he would not want to exchange, because he knows where his, you know, his daughter is. Mm -hmm. But man, what an amazing story and uh, just what a wonderful family and the hope that they have. And I think what I'm sensing from Paul and Jana is because they have this amazing hope for eternity and for future, they're able to be so productive now. And I, and I'm, you know, I think as people were watching this today, you thought, how is that possible? I mean, is this a delusion? No, it's not a delusion. It's hope in a God that loves you. That's why Jesus came. He came to die to, you know, so we could be with a righteous and holy God, spend eternity with him. And Cheryl, that is the great hope. And, and this family is living it and what an inspiration. One of the things I love about Paul and Jana, and you probably saw in that interview, is he is so determined to have, to go after God with all of his heart, soul and mind, no matter what the cost, he's gonna keep pursuing God. And, and the benefit of that is that he's free in a way that many of us are still on the journey to myself included. He yeah. challenges me and I, I love that about him because I'm like, yeah, God, there's more and I, and I wanna be so committed. And I have to agree with him, the hard place in my life are where I've learned the biggest lessons and you may feel like God has left you and sometimes I felt that way when it's hard I don't feel him but I know he's close and when I look back I see he was close you know I love to tell the stories of when I went through something tough and God got me through it but it's when we're going through those difficulties as you know sometimes we get kind of blinded by it so I'd encourage you to call our prayer lines there's people standing by they want to talk to you and you know just remember we love you God loves you, that's even more important, and he's got a plan and purpose for your life. You're not alone. You're not alone. See you next time. Bye. Thank you for your ongoing support of Crossroads, a member of the Canadian Council of Christian Charities. You can write to Crossroads, PO Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 4M2.